uh, Congressman John Faso. Good morning, Congressman. Thanks so much for being with us. Good morning, Fred. Good to have you. Before I ask you uh, to respond to what the governor had to say about you, could you describe what this amendment to the new Health Care Act would do in terms of its impact on New York? Uh, Fred, thank you. Um, first, uh, I proposed this actually when I was running for office uh, last year. And I said the very first bill I was going to introduce in the House was a bill that would eliminate the ability of a state to transfer its obligations to pay for Medicaid onto county governments and therefore county property taxpayers. And um, in this reconciliation process with Medicaid, I realized that this was an opportunity for us to craft a provision to put into this reconciliation legislation. So what the bill does, uh, what the amendment in this uh, reconciliation bill does, is it would say that as of 2020, so the state has two and a half years to get ready for this, as of 2020, the state may no longer impose a local burden on certain political jurisdictions, meaning counties, excluding the city of New York, uh, in order to pay for Medicaid. The amendment is crafted in such a way that it applies only to the state of New York. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Number one, it, it reduces complexity with other states that have different approaches here. But if you consider the totality of the local government Medicaid costs in the entire country, it's a little over $9 billion each year. $7.2 billion of that $9 billion is imposed on local governments in New York State. So this has been something that the successive state legislatures and governors have made some progress on, and uh, they've reduced gradually the cost burden on counties and their property taxpayers, but they haven't eliminated it. And there's no uh, indication that anyone in Albany takes this seriously to eliminate this property tax burden. And as you know, Fred, I have uh, congratulated and applauded the governor on the property tax cap, which I think was important and significant, but we need to do more. And this is the ultimate of government consolidation, if you will. The, the counties have no business, and the property taxpayers should have no business paying for state Medicaid costs. The government that confers the benefit, namely the state, should be the same government which has to raise the revenue uh, to pay for the benefit. And John, let me just interrupt you for a second. I mean, I think yeah. it's worth pointing out it's very important that in New York State there's a Cadillac or a platinum level of services that are mandated by the state to be provided under Medicaid that the counties have no choice in. They must accede to the costs that are imposed on them by the state, and I think that's worth pointing out. Yeah, it, it, it definitely is worth pointing out. The critical piece here, Fred, is that New York – since Nelson Rockefeller has imposed this disproportionate burden on the on the counties and the city of New York. But I excluded the city of New York from this uh, amendment for two reasons. One, the city of New York is more akin to actually a state government in so many ways. But it also, number two, has its own income tax. And, it's rolling um, in dough, number three. Well, and that's number three. But <laughs> So $2.2 billion of that burden in New York State is borne by property taxpayers, both business property taxpayers and homeowners. Right. And it's high time. The thing that is driving people out of upstate New York, and every single county in my district has lost population in the last five years, and most counties upstate continue to lose population as they have for the last 30 to 40 sure. years. What is driving people away, there's not enough jobs, there's not enough economic opportunity, and the property taxes are too high. So it's, well, John, it's I think what – yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, though, time, let me, let me just time. say, it seems to me you're calling the governor's bluff on this. He's promised for years that there was going to be mandate relief. You remember his commercials in 2010 with people on top of their houses holding signs saying how much they're paying in property taxes. They're still paying those property taxes. The property tax cap didn't lower anybody's taxes. They've been going up. What do you make of yeah. the governor then coming so fiercely at you and – Uh, Congressman Chris Collins, referring to your rabid conservative zealotry. (laughs) Well, I I just laughed when I heard that. It's kind of uh, ridiculous. A death trap. It's it's very, very – it's it's sad, really, that that they resort to that kind of rhetoric. Again, I'm leaving two and a half years for the state to prepare for this. And we look at at state government spending in a whole host of areas. 
And there are plenty of areas that are less important in my mind than relieving the burden on, on average working people in our state. And that's what this amendment does. Now he's trying to scare the hospitals, saying, oh, this is going to come out of your hide. Well, the fact is, two and a half years they have to prepare for this. That's really including this one, three full budget cycles to prepare for this. And there's no reason to play scare tactics. This is, uh, I watch them do a Buffalo billion. I hear them propose a Brooklyn billion. I look at four hundred million dollars. A Bronx billion. Yeah, I look Just at, I look at a, I look at a $430 million in tax credits going to uh, movie producers. Some call that co- corporate welfare. I look at a billion and a half dollars a year being spent on so-called economic development projects. And I'm not saying all of these things are bad. I'm saying the priorities of our state should consider finally eliminating the burden on the property taxpayers. And the perfect way to do it is to do what virtually all of the other states do, Fred. They don't impose the Medicaid burden of their program on the local property taxpayers. And that's what I'm trying to address. And that's what this amendment does. You know, a few people have pointed out that the governor's statement, Cuomo's statement, really painted uh, a dismal picture, and I think maybe accurately so, of upstate New York, in particular Long Island also, saying if the federal stream of money was reduced to these uh, communities through Medicaid, you, uh, cutbacks in Medicaid, that there would be a devastating impact on the economy, that you could have an economic collapse, which is a kind of implicit admission, is it not, that the uh, economies under his uh, administration for seven years are now in such desperate straits that they're dependent on government handouts. Well, Fred, in actual point of fact, a number of us have been working very hard behind the scenes to make sure that we had a per capita Medicaid funding going forward that uh, addresses the disabled and people in nursing homes at a, at a larger rate because those folks cost more money. And we've succeeded in this manager's amendment of getting additional funding for people that are in that circumstance, so the elderly and disabled uh, are better represented in terms of the reimbursement the state would receive. We've also preserved the Medicaid expansion, which, frankly, a lot of people didn't want to do uh, through 2000, the end of 2019. And uh, the folks that are on the Medicaid expansion, the state would still receive the accelerated uh, reimbursement for those folks until they cycle off the program. But the, the bottom line here, Fred, is that uh, the ACA, the uh, so-called Obamacare system, is spiraling out of control in many, many states across the country. There have been extraordinary, you know, less. I acknowledge some people, many people have been benefited, but also just as many people have been hurt by the spike in premiums, by the increased deductibles. And what we're trying to do is reform this, bring more market-centered principles into the equation. But uh, scare tactics towards hospitals and others uh, are unnecessary and really uncalled for. And what this amendment that I'm doing finally fixes a 51-year <laughs> mistake that Nelson Rockefeller made. I've wanted to do this for many years. I proposed it in my campaign last year. And, Fred, I'm proud to say 75 days into my tenure in Congress, I've actually been able to uh, move this process forward. I'm hopeful that it, it makes it through the entire process and and gets to the president for his signature. Well, I think it is a remarkable accomplishment because the question of a state pickup of local Medicaid costs has been on the agenda for decades in New York. What's the likelihood that your amendment will be approved by the uh, Republican majority? Well, included in the bill to be voted on Thursday. It's included in the bill. And the question is, will the, yes, it's included in the bill. And the the question will be whether the, the bill passes on Thursday. And I think I think for the most part, I think it'll pass the House. Um, I think there'll also be further changes in the Senate. Um, and um, it's still an ongoing negotiating process. But, you know, the people in my district, I think, sent me here to legislate, sent me here to try to fix problems that are affecting them and their families and making it more difficult to live in upstate New York. And we have to restore the economy. And a lot of that has to do with regulatory and tax changes. But a lot of it also has to do with relieving the burden of the property tax. And I figured out a way, when I read the federal law, I figured out a way to do this. And it's, it's, uh, it's up to Albany to finally take responsibility for this program. 
To what extent is this uh, amendment of yours, though, a political expedient of the House leadership, Paul Ryan and others, in order to get the support of people like yourself and Chris Collins, maybe Claudia Tenney, more moderate Republicans, as some would see it, to, for the uh, overall uh, Obamacare replacement? I, I think that actually is less. Uh, uh, an inducement, frankly. There may be some of that, but frankly, it wasn't uh, the consideration that I had. I just uh, basically, as a legislator, I saw this as a vehicle through which we could accomplish this. And there was objection that, uh, well, we don't want to affect other states, and there may be a problem with that. And and working with uh, people down here, we fashioned something that would only impact the state of New York. And indeed, Fred, when you consider $7.2 billion, of local Medicaid costs out of $9 billion are here in our state. That's sure. Tell everyone in Albany there's something wrong with the way we've been doing this. So we need to fix it. To what extent, uh, if you have a feel for it, do you think that there will be support if it passes on Thursday in the House in a reconciliation with the Senate and a final bill, if there is a final bill, what do you think the chances are to include this amendment in it? Um, I think they're very good. The question, the question will always be uh, in terms of provisions that are in this bill that that whether they fly um, uh, and comport with the Senate rules on reconciliation and it's a it's a complicated technical matter I think we've crafted this so that it does uh, uh, make it through the Senate parliamentary process but um, you know I've I've I at this point I just wanted to get this this provision in this bill I've been working on this for two months and again I told people when I, in my district when I ran last year that this was a goal of mine, and many people asked me, well, how can you do that? How can you do it? And I said, I figured out a way to do it, and indeed, that's the manifestation of what is in this legislation now. We are fixing a 51-year mistake in New York State. It would be an extraordinary accomplishment if it does become law. What about the possibility of the President Trump, a New Yorker, who I guess you're going to be meeting with shortly, he's coming to your conference, uh, will uh, you know, back a proposal like this? Is he aware of it, and do you know if he, could, if he does or might support it? I, I don't know if he personally is aware of it, but I know that the staff in the White House that uh, uh, worked on this and, and made some suggestions on it uh, are certainly aware of it. And Fred, actually, the president was speaking to our, is speaking to our conference right now, and I left a little early to come speak to you and your audience. Well, I'm honored to have you with us. That's quite a uh, decision to make to choose uh, your audience. Really, a lot of it is your district over the president. I'll let you go with that in mind. But just quickly, one other thing. It seems to me kind of extraordinary that Governor Cuomo and other Democrats in New York, at a time when the presidency and Congress, both houses, are both in Republican hands, the presidency and Republican hands are so partisan, whether it's uh, Cuomo or Schumer or uh, Eric Schneiderman, do you think in a way they're putting their own political interests ahead of the interests of the people of New York in terms of dealing with the Republicans who control the federal government now? Uh, I think it's regrettable. I had a a moderate Democrat um, in the House who I've gone come to know tell me the other day that that his base is so furious with the political situation that they're yelling at him because he's not going out every day with his hair on fire. And uh, they feel a lot of pressure from the uh, the left in their party to uh, be especially oppositional on things. And, and look, I also understand uh, the nature of uh, what people are objecting to. I mean, I have not been a a down-the-line supporter of everything that the president has done, nor some of the language and rhetoric that he has used. And I I think that uh, we really need to try to bring the country together on a lot of these issues because we face important issues. So I'm trying to get beyond that partisanship. Um, and candidly, Fred, uh, the reason uh, I'm focused on legislating, and that's why I've been working for two months to craft a provision that we could put in this reconciliation bill. And I'm very proud that uh, just a little over two and a half months in Congress, I was able to accomplish this and uh, to get it this far at this stage and fixing a 51-year bad policy in New York State. Just because we've done something for a half a century I mean, doesn't mean we have to continue it. Well, Congressman John Faso, congratulations on that. Good luck in your efforts, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Okay, take care. I'll let you get back to the second best thing, meeting with the President of the United States and joining your Republican conference in the House. Just for kidding about that. It was very nice of uh, Congressman Faso, considering he could have been uh, with the President and many other members of his conference as well. This is Fred Dicker. The show is live from the State Capitol. Uh, we're going to take a break right now and be right back.